Okay, okay. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us here at the Redwire booth for happy hour. My name is Camille Bergen. I am a space content creator. You might have seen my videos online as the Galactic Gal. Um, I'm your host for this week's events at the Redwire booth, so be sure to come by tomorrow as well. We have way more of these programmed tomorrow. And also, please grab a beer. We have plenty left over here. I don't see nearly enough people with beer in their hands. I also just had one, so come on, join me. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Bill here. Um, we are going to talk about a space warfighter talk uh, hosted by the Space Force Association and presented by Redwire. Thank you so much, Camille. I really do appreciate the opportunity Redwire has afforded the Space Force Association to continue to tell the phenomenal story of the United States Space Force and their guardians. SFA is honored to be the only nonprofit organization solely dedicated to the U.S. Space Force and their guardians. So, I, and, I'm, and quite honestly, I'm really honored to be here with a good friend. Actually, probably volunteer number five in the organization, wearing his SFA pin discreetly under his lapel, is Lieutenant Colonel, or more appropriately, Colonel Select, Garrett Blade Dolman. Sir, thanks so much for being with us today. Thanks a lot, Hippie, I really appreciate it. Uh, that was an overly flattering introduction. <laughs> Uh, but it's a privilege to be here and really appreciate everything that uh, Space Force Association and your corporate members do to help us spread the word about the Space Force. I think one of our biggest problems is there's too few guardians for every American to know what a guardian is uh, and what the Space Force does, so really appreciate everything you do on our behalf. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, Blade. Really what I want to talk about, and we're going to get into it in just a second, is what a lot of people talking about is the National Space Test and Training Complex. I don't think we can start talking about that, though, until we get your background and how you transition from the Air Force and how your expertise qualifies you to help stand up this critical national capability. But first, let's hear about the 25th Space Range Squadron, which you're currently commanding. Sir, tell us, tell us about that. Right, uh, so the 25th Space Range Squadron is, uh, is a 20-year-old squadron executing range activities for the Space Force. Um, I think a lot of people don't realize that we've had actual counter space activities that entire time. Uh, and what we do is provide the arena in which systems can be tested safely and securely, and guardians can train and develop their tactics safely and securely uh, in the space electronic warfare mission area. Um, and we're doing everything we can to adapt that to the new expectations of a warfighting service uh, in Delta 11. So the 25th used to be the only space range operators uh, for those purposes. Uh, we're now joined by the 98th Space Range Squadron that operates an orbital uh, portion of the range. Uh, and we have a smaller team that's getting ready to be a squadron eventually when it grows that does the same for the defensive cyber portion of warfighters fighting, uh, fighting the good fight. So space control, offensive, defensive, cyber space control, offensive, defensive, basically creating a playground, if you will, to demonstrate advanced tactics in a safe environment. Yeah, the, the mandate is absolutely safe and secure. So the, the purpose of the range goes back to historic events that, uh, that unfortunately I can't talk about, but it, it all really comes down to how do we make sure that we can go out and, and demonstrate the ability to do that responsible counter space campaigning that General Saltzman talks about? Uh, so what that really means is on the safety front, we want to make sure that when we go out as a U.S. Space Force and, uh, and practice behaviors that are war fighting behaviors, that we can do it in a way uh, that doesn't inadvertently harm other nations or harm uh, commercial entities on orbit. Uh, from a security standpoint, we want to make sure that warfighters can validate the tactics and the systems that they're working on uh, and be able to practice them as realistically as possible, right? We want to get good, realistic repetitions uh, so that we're not caught flat-footed when we go against an adversary, but we want to do it in a way where they can't see all of the techniques that we're using. Uh, so that's where safety and security come in. Uh, and then I think changing expectations of a warfighting service, the one thing I add, I'd really add to that is assessment. So the other thing we do when we present that, uh, that arena, that playground, uh, is it's instrumented, right? So we go out there and we collect higher than normal amounts of domain awareness and collect information so that we can really measure, did that new capability that we just bought from one of these vendors, does it have the effect that we expected? Is the probability of effect uh, where we want it to be or do we need to keep working on it? And can guardians reliably recreate that effect because they're competent with their tactics? Thank you, sir. And just for the audience perspective, 
tell us a little bit about your background. Again, how did that, how did your career evolve to go from the Air Force into the Space Force? Yeah, a little convoluted. My, my dad just recently showed me a scrapbook from when I was in fourth grade, so apparently it starts there. I didn't realize how much of a uh, space advocate I was. You know, almost every newspaper clipping I captured was about the space shuttle or some satellite that was going up. Um, so I joined the Air Force and became a, an air battle manager. I spent the majority of my flying career uh, on combat deployments, counter narcotics deployments with AWACS and JSTARS. Um, so what, what I think the ingredient there uh, that answers your question is a real passion for, for two things, and that is taking a, a lot of disparate capabilities and merging them together to doing the integration that lets this thing from the air and this non-kinetic thing and this piece of information turn into an effect that a combatant commander can rely on for a campaign. Um, so there's that. The, the other part of it, I think, is really um, an inherent jointness, that there was no part, there is no part of a combatant commander's problem that only one unit is going to solve for them. It is always going to be multiple capabilities, multiple services, multiple domains, multiple uh, international partners um, to make those things happen. So I had that background uh, and a passion for training. And then at some point, the service kind of expects as part of the up and out career progression that you will get a master's degree. And I was like, well, uh, that sounds like a lot of work. I might as well do it in something I'm interested in. So back to that fourth grade uh, scrapbook, I was like, well, I'm an air guy, but I'll get a space degree. Um, and where that ended up being really valuable is right before uh, the Space Force was born, we were in the process of acquiring some of these capabilities that acknowledge space is a contested domain. And a lot of those capabilities don't come with a playbook, right? You build out a capability and you're like, great, how do I test that? I don't know. Uh, and what tactics will I use to employ that? I don't know. And so one thing that, the, that then AFSpace was doing was they were bringing a lot of air domain tacticians to Schriever and to Peterson and just sitting them down and saying, here's what the space capability is. What do you already have published in other domain tactics that applies? Um, and the answer is a fair bit. There's plenty of things where space is actually different, right? But there's a lot that we could learn from uh, previously published air tactics. And I had the privilege uh, of getting to do that for a couple of years. And at one point, a senior officer finally realized, hey, you're kind of good. You have the translation matrix. Yeah. So the shortest answer to your question, I think, is uh, a Rosetta Stone. Yeah. I could speak multi-domain tactics and integration, and I could speak to the technical aspects of space. Um, and that gave me the, the real privilege uh, to be offered an opportunity to join the Space Force in its first year. Awesome, and congratulations on your command. And you're going to graduate from that command this summer. But let's pull the thread just a little bit on the need to provide an advanced training playground to demonstrate capability and certify expertise. So I've talked to senior leaders in the Space Force about this before, where it'd be what we're experiencing in the space service right now would be akin to fielding the, the fifth, generation, fifth generation fighter with, uh, with the pilot having no flying hours in the jet. So tell us a little bit about how, we're sol how you're helping to solve that problem of creating expertise on this virtual environment safely. Yeah, that's, that's a really good way to put it. The funny thing is I often say the opposite, which is uh, to say that we, have, we know these really advanced warfighting concepts but we are still flying with capabilities that are much more primitive than what technology could do yeah. for a variety of reasons. You know, it's almost like I know how an F-22 and an air operations center could work, but you have issued me the right military flyer. Yeah. So I don't have the power and the sensors <laughs> and the sortie duration to go do all these things. So when right. we talk about things like power and delta V as limitations to current space systems, I, I could think of a lot of really creative ways to solve problems that I can't apply and I have to, have to really work in the weeds. Uh, which I guess is my way of saying that the problem is that uh, space is hard <laughs> and, uh, and that even our modeling and sim capabilities are not fully validated. So you can't, you can't just go out and, and do a number of iterations of a model and say that you're satisfied for two really big reasons. One, um, that you haven't proven it in the domain, right? Yep. Uh, and two is the warfighters need realism. So I think, I think what I'd really like to say in answer is a lot of times when we talk about realism of test and training, we talk about the models or we talk about the environments and there's really a third ingredient and that is how realistic is the task 
that the guardian or the joint warfighter is performing. So if you're, everything is really realistically played out for an effect in a modeling and sim tool, but it is not actually using the user interface that the crew that would take that capability into combat uses, it, it does not close a kill chain, right? right. You, do not, you don't actually solve the mission. Uh, an analogy would be uh, an F-22 pilot you know, sitting in front of a, you know, inside of a Cessna 172 simulator that just happens to play out the effects of, a, of an air-to-air -air missile. Well, great, he gets the concept of how to employ the missile. He doesn't get the muscle memory of what button to push and when and how it feels and looks. Uh, so the biggest thing I think that the NSTTC approach, that National right. Space Test and Training Complex approach brings is we only bring the weapon systems or a digital twin of the weapon systems onto the range. Right. So when a warfighter sits down, either for test or training, they are doing it the way they would do it if they were asked uh, by a combatant commander to go employ today. That's a really important concept that I, I don't think a lot of people are, are connecting the dots between what Space Forces space is and again, demonstrating capability to the combatant commands who have a, a requirement to gain and maintain space superiority or a, a partial requirement, just like they do for all the other domains. Mm -hmm. So how is that playing out in demonstration or what is a, what is a concept that you're thinking about and playing that out via a vignette, unclassified vignette? Yeah, I, the, the short answer to that, how, how is it gonna play out? It, it has to be combined arms. Okay. So Legacy Air Force Space Command did a lot of things in capability stovepipes. Yeah. And to an extent, um, that's a challenge we're still working through. One of the things that range activities do is we are trying to embrace that we want to host events yep. that are inherently more than one capability, more than one squadron, more than one space delta, um, and including joint and international partners in those range events. So that the vignette is that I walk in and I plan for a Space Force hosted exercise, uh, and that is a diverse cross-section of, for example, Space Operations Command. Not just for one delta, not labeled for one mission area, we all brief together, and then the, the change now is we all go in and we sit down at something that resembles the same ground segment that we use to operate that jammer or that sensor or that cyber system right. uh, or to, to uh, command that satellite, and we fly it out in real time, which is not a thing that Guardians get to do very often. And then we sit down and we have real truth data of exactly how that went, and we learn from it together at the end. That's awesome, I think everyone is tired of white carding space superiority. We're now at a point in our history, as we continuously define it, that we can't afford to white card the space superiority effects that we know we need. So is it the intent to continue to evolve the space test and training complex as it continues to develop capability? And then I know what industry is doing right now is they're chomping at the bit to help out with creating that capability for the NSTTC, so talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I'd add, I'd add one more layer to that, and okay. that's that we're inherently, a, we're a global, a global service for a global domain. Okay. So as we start to figure out what the Space Force components uh, mean, not just for presentation, but also for currency training or exercise right. participation, right. Uh, there's an aspect of even if allocated a capability, how does Geographic Combatant Command exercise that capability? So. I think the immediate growth areas are in the delivery of the first couple of systems we imagined for the orbital range and the cyber range. And an interesting, I think maybe contrary to expectation that the, the first places where we're able to do that integration yeah. is live and in real time. And what I mean by that is if we're doing that safe and secure part on the range right, there are things that we are not prepared Operationally, we have systems that don't talk to each other. Right. So definitely on a training side, they don't yet talk to each other. So the best way to do that is put the human being, the human beings are the thing that get rid of the white card. You put them in the same room, you make them fly out the live event and record what happens, and then learn from that how to close the machine to machine gap, or learn to build the digital environment that helps. The long-term answer is absolutely digital environments. The, the space is big. Space moves really fast and moves really slow. And 
range capabilities that are entirely live are limited in scalability. So really, the, the evolution of digital environments, digital twins for red, blue, and other, uh, and the presentation of those to any US or international partner that has access to, the, to our range is a really critical growth area yeah. for us over the next couple of years that we're working on requirements for right now. And, and really what you're touching on too in this discussion is the criticality of culture development. General Saltzman talks about it all the time. So what is the culture you want to start to create based on the repetitions that you're creating on the ranges? Yeah, the, the range aspect of that, I think there's a huge opportunity to put getting on the range early in a Guardian's career and getting on the range frequently throughout a Guardian's career is really critical. So I, I talk a lot about early and often, and we're not there yet, but the analogy is pretty clear. If you fly an airplane, you are taking it into a controlled environment and you know, flying those skills out in a safe and secure place against realistic targets frequently. Yep. If you are an infantryman, in basic training, you're learning how to work a rifle, right. and throughout your career, no matter what else you do, no matter what rank you get or job you get, you're going to continue to do reps on that fundamental tactical skill. And we need guardians to do the same thing. Yep. So shifting that to culture, that, that is the transition to a warfighting culture. And I think figuring out the ways for that are going to be unique, very unique in the joint force for how guardians cultivate from initial joining the service through the end of their career, cultivate a warrior spirit is going to be difficult because life as a guardian is different. I think it's very stressful over the course of a career for no other reason than how frequently things change on us. Yeah. Um, but that's not the same as being in the field, integrating with your joint partners. Yep. That's not the same as taking fire or living in a, in a foxhole. Yep. And so how do you get that same tenacious pursuit of victory, loathing of defeat, and <laughs> loyalty to a team that are really critical ingredients of a warrior ethos when you don't have those forcing mechanisms, right? right? When yeah. hopefully we never actually take the Space Force to a real shooting war. Right. Because deterrence should work. We should be so competent uh, that we deter. So figuring that out is hard, and I think routine, realistic training on a range is A, critical ingredient in that. Thank you, uh, uh, that summarizes it very well. And I suspect what's gonna happen after we conclude this talk this afternoon, you're gonna be bombarded by industry wanting to help out. I, what I would offer to industry is, there's a way to help out the Space Force by partnering with the Space Force Association to help solve these problems. In fact, our next Space Power Conference, Space Power 24, is focused on partnering to win. Yeah, I saw you at Space Power 23. I was is proud that, to be there. Is that, is that helping to, again, demonstrate that culture and bring that, bring that teamwork together? Uh, absolutely. Um, any opportunity to bring Guardians together is a really big deal. I think uh, if nobody saw any of the media coverage, uh, I really wish we'd gotten a, a, a class photo, a family photo, because <laughs> one of the things that was really unique about that event that was the largest gathering of Guardians that I, at least, personally have ever seen. And it was really fascinating to see Guardians from every command, almost every Delta, all in one place uh, to meet with each other. So uh, culturally, I think that did a couple of things for us. That's an, obviously a networking opportunity. I think for a lot of uh, junior Guardians, it was a real eye-opener that when senior service leaders say, we need every Guardian engaged, every Guardian has a voice. Uh, what culture is for a Guardian is a collaborative experiment. Yeah. I think that became a lot more real when they realized that our service is small enough that you can know the name of every general <laughs> officer in our service. That is a, that is a doable task. Right. And that you can go to an event like that and they're not all always being escorted around by you know, the team and hidden from you. They will stop you at lunch and ask you questions. I sat at a table with a couple of young lieutenants and we were just kind of, I think they were initially like, oh, I'm talking to a lieutenant colonel. And five minutes later, General Bratton dropped by and now it's not me that they're, they're excited to be talking to anymore, right? And that's an amazing opportunity that Space Power did for us. Um, and I think SFA helped us experiment with how, how do we express 
guardianship, for lack of a better term, right. differently than the other services express their identities. And that, I mean, just the fact that you had a rock cover of the national anthem was a really good example. <laughs> Thank you. No, and that was a shameless plug. I, I understand that. And we are planning right now for Space Power 24, but the, the nuance is what we're doing is we're demonstrating that partnership that needs to exist in the culture today as we lead up to Space Power 24. So uh, we were just talking to some senior leaders in the Space Force, and there is a, you know, there's a, a nomenclature that we use sometimes. It's called the slimy contractor. Well, the fact is we can't say slimy contractors anymore because contractors are critical to the space superiority mission. And the partner has got to have to be the contractor who's providing that critical capability. So we got to remove that nomenclature and start to envelop those capabilities and describe and develop out that culture. So we're going to start doing that today with what we're doing for our programming leading up to Space Power 24 so that you all can get the capabilities you desperately need. That's fantastic and I appreciate it. I, uh, I've even gotten to the point where in some cases I'm, I'm almost, when I say TFI, total force integration, <laughs> I almost sometimes mean the contractors because we have yes. the, the relationship that some of our critical providers have with us is uh, more integrated in mission than in a lot of other um, joint mission areas. So that's essential and I appreciate it. Thank you, before we conclude, which I, I know there's gonna be questions, we're not gonna take questions now because we are live and we want to make sure that you all have time to answer questions after this, but before we do, what most of you don't know is when Colonel Dolman came on board as a volunteer at SFA, he changed our logo for us. And so, this is, we're on our third logo now, but he was the second logo and he said, hey, we gotta, we gotta change this logo up. So we did that, and what my mom did is she screen printed flags with that logo on it. So what I want to do, Blade, is I want to present to you your logo, SFA flag, as a flag bearer yeah. of SFA. Thank you very much, Hippie. I appreciate that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hang that up in the office. That's I know fantastic. you will. <laughs> hey, thanks so much, Blade. I appreciate uh, it. Yeah, we, we've got a tradition, too. And I, uh, so just for being the first person to publicly interview me in a forum this big, I just want to give you a headsman coin from the 25th Space Marine Squadron. Thanks for everything you do. Thank you, Colonel. I really do appreciate it. Thank Thanks you. for your time today. I know there's going to be folks that want to ask some questions, but before we do, let me turn it back over to Camille. And thanks again to Redwire for allowing SFA the opportunity to have this Space Warfighter talk. Camille, back over Thank to you. you. Thanks so much. Thank you, guys. That was amazing. Learned so much.